strange lights in the night sky. Mysterious crafts hovering over the countryside. Even reports of UFOs over America's Capitol building. The inexplicable sightings have been happening for decades. This is not a drill. It's real. Find out what the world's governments will do when UFOs arrive. February 27th, 1996. A commuter plane, flight 5959, leaves Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, heading to Saginaw, Michigan, just outside of Detroit. It begins as a routine flight, but then... The plane encounters a UFO. On the ground, air traffic controllers scan their radar screens. Air shuttle 5959, that's a negative, sir. I don't have anything out in front of you at 12 to 1 o'clock. But the pilot of a nearby plane also chimes in. We can see a clear, you know, relatively solid cloud deck uh, below us. And this is definitely a, a distinct uh, white, whitish, uh, well, they're looking a little red and greenish white sort of pulsating and it is consonant. It's not a beacon. Suddenly, the pilot of Flight 5959 is forced to take evasive action. Keep it advised, uh, we're descending to 4,000 feet right now, and as we descend it through 10,000 feet, uh, that object is above us right now. Uh, it is not on the ground. It's about 10,000 feet. Okay, sir, uh, we're checking on it right now. I still don't have anything out in front of you at all. I'll right, tell you what, that is weird if you sit in the pulsating. This ordeal lasts nearly 20 minutes. Then, the strange object simply disappears. No passengers or crew are injured in this encounter. And the airlines involved, following industry practice, will offer no comment on the incident. According to the National Aviation Reporting Center on anomalous phenomena, Flight 5959's encounter was just one of over 100 such incidents involving American aircraft in 1996. What should the pilot do in such a situation? Does the U.S. government have an official protocol to deal with UFOs and extraterrestrials? Yes, it does. And it's outlined in the Joint Army-Navy-Air Force publication number 146. Also known as JANIPS, this 32-page document was written in 1950 during the Cold War and outlines detailed protocol for encounters with unidentified flying objects. The uh, Joint Army-Navy Committee realized that America was vulnerable to enemy attack from the air and from space. And so the Joint Chiefs decided to institute an observer corps that was made up not only of military observers but civilian observers in the cockpits of civilian aircraft. So they required, with this official regulation, that commercial crews should report instantly, uh, using radio means, anything that they couldn't identify. And it was defined very broadly, but one of the categories was UFO, unidentified flying objects. While commercial pilots are not required to read JANAP 146, FAA regulations do mandate that the document be kept at all air traffic control facilities. Reports filed under the JANAP 146 rules are called surveys or communications instruction for reporting vital intelligence sightings. The regulations cover both instantaneous radio communications and after-incident reports. 
They say what to report, which includes UFOs. They say how to report them. And they say what to include in your report, including size, shape, speed, and so on. GenApp 146, subpart 3B, defines how to render size comparisons and provides lists of adjectives to be used. Head of a pin, a pea, a dime, up to baseball, grapefruit, and basketball. Part 104 reads, every effort should be made to substantiate sightings by taking as many pictures as possible. They're clear, concise, to the point, and still current. When it was revised in 1977, UFOs was still in there, still to be reported, and still to this day. And as publicly available FAA recordings show, these encounters do still continue. According to the regulations, pilots must explain exactly what they see, even when what they see defies explanation. My view of pilots is that they're very high credibility witnesses. They're calm, cool, and collected. They know what they're doing. They're not given to uh, foolishness and hysteria. And that uh, I would listen very carefully to something that a pilot told me. It was pretty eerie looking. First time in 15 years I've ever seen anything like it. May 26th, 1995. 35,000 feet above New Mexico. The captain of Flight 564 radios FAA control with reports of a large cigar-shaped silhouette with eight evenly spaced lights appearing just off his wingtip. Yeah, off to our um, 3 o'clock. Get some strokes out there. Can you tell us what it is? Uh, I'll tell you what, that's some uh, right now. I don't know what it is right now. There is a restricted area that's uh, used by the military on during the daytime. Yeah, it's pretty odd. Hold on, let me see if anybody else knows about it. Though not required to by JANAP-146, the air traffic controller contacts the U.S. Air Force to check for any unusual aerial activity. Uh, no, we haven't heard nothing about it. Okay. Uh, guy at 39,000 says you see something at 30,000 that the length is unbelievable and it has a strobe on it. This is not good. <laughs> okay. uh, wait, what does that mean? I don't know. It's a UFO. So it's the Roswell crap again. The pilot of Flight 564 loses sight of the UFO. But the controller makes further inquiries, contacting NORAD, the North American Aerospace Command. We don't have anything going on yeah. that I know of. This guy definitely saw it run all the way down the side of the airplane. It's right out of uh, the X-Files. I mean, it's a, it's a definite UFO or something like that. I, but, I mean, and, and, oh, y'all are serious about this. Yeah. How long did he think it was? He said he was 300 to 400 foot long. Holy smoke. Headquartered deep beneath Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado, NORAD tracks all airborne objects in the skies over the U.S. and Canada. It is also the official ultimate destination for the survey's reports that pilots must file when they've encountered a UFO. And though the regulation makes no specific reference to what exactly NORAD will do with these documents, JANAP 146 does say, Every attempt will be made to verify the authenticity of surveys reports. Where possible, authentication will be required. But NORAD is a super secretive agency, and efforts to discover what it does with the surveys reports are often frustrated. NORAD is not subject to the Freedom of Information Act, and they completely 100% deny any existence of UFO records. In fact, in one letter, NORAD tried to tell me they didn't even know what JANAP 146 was. And in JANAP 146, in black and white, says NORAD as the retrieval agency for these UFO reports. The other thing about JANAP 146 has to do with penalties that you would incur if you were to report this through non-official channels. These penalties were severe. They included imprisonment and I think a $10,000 fine. Mighty big incentive to keep your mouth shut. And many believe there are also other forces that limit pilots from making any reports of UFOs. I think there's tremendous pressure, just in society in general, that discourages people from bringing up things that are considered paranormal. UFOs, flying saucers being one of them. This breeds secrecy. Secrecy breeds distrust. 
that generates more pressure in this, this terrible, you know, kind of cycle. To many researchers in the field, this silence is likely a result of what seems to be the primary goal of U.S. government policy on UFOs, secrecy. It seems clear from a lot of the government discussions of the problem of contact that they wouldn't make this known to the public if it happened. The general attitude of the government about not only about UFOs but many other things is just to play it safe and not tell the public what's going on. But many outside the government are increasingly certain that to play it safe, we need a detailed plan to deal with the UFO potential. When we return, if a fake radio broadcast can set off a panic, just imagine what a real alien invasion would do. May 30th, 1995, Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. August 24th, 1990. Griefswald, Germany. July 6th, 1995. Tirana, Albania. Many researchers believe that with the increasing number of UFO sightings, it is just a matter of time before an irrefutable alien encounter happens. In that case, what plans do we have for dealing with them? What if the aliens are hostile, intent on conquering us? How will people react? A dress rehearsal for just such a scenario took place in 1938 during a radio broadcast to the eastern United States. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. War of the Worlds was a science fiction story written in the 1890s and broadcast by Orson Welles on his Mercury Theater of the Air. The battle which took place tonight at Grove of Mills has ended in one of the most startling defeats ever suffered by an army in modern times. But it was a very powerful broadcast, and it led to attacks on the radio station and things like that. 7,000 men armed with rifles and machine guns hit it against the single fighting machine of the invaders from Mars. Many people did not realize that they were listening to a radio play, uh, became panicked by what they heard. The broadcast ignited hysteria. Switchboards up and down the East Coast were overloaded with frightened callers. Hundreds of people evacuated their homes. The police even received eyewitness reports of fires raging from the attack. Many people took protective kinds of action that looked silly in retrospect, but seemed very sensible uh, to the people at the time. And uh, uh, the social psychologists have had a wonderful thing to study ever since. Summer 1952, Washington, D.C. With widespread reports of UFO sightings over the nation's capital, the alien invasion scenario became all too real to the U.S. government. What happened next would impact UFO policy for decades. This included radar observations, this included incursions by multiple phenomenon over the Capitol building, and it definitely raised the concern of the United States Air Force. It was bedlam for a while there. It was two weekends in a row where UFOs were seen over the White House. Um, we know that President Truman was very concerned about this. The CIA was absolutely intent on doing something about this problem. In January 1953, the CIA convened a panel of scientists and military advisors to study the UFO issue, headed by H.P. Robertson of the California Institute of Technology. While the Robertson panel unanimously concluded that UFOs posed no direct threat to national security, the panel did suggest a plan for dealing with them. The Robertson panel concluded that it was in the best interest of the United States government to suppress media coverage of UFO sightings. And to do that, they recommended a number of standard propaganda methods. They wanted, first of all, to use ridicule to cast the subject into disrepute. And this was in the context of a training program that they wanted to put out, an educational campaign, which would involve two components, training and debunking. They use the word debunking, and they actually say that the mass media should be employed uh, by the national security apparatus of the United States 
to control the way the UFO subject was presented. United States UFO policy would continue to evolve. Evidence of this would be found in a report hidden in top secret files of the Federal Archives for more than 30 years. Known in the UFO community as the Brookings Report, it was prepared for both NASA and the United States Congress. The Brookings Institute report uh, dates from the very end of 1960. And this was something that was uh, conducted on behalf of NASA uh, at the very beginning of the space program to discuss the implications of space travel. It was led by a psychologist, uh, Donald Michael, team of six writers and uh, maybe 60 consultants, including people with good name recognition like Margaret Mead. As you get to the end of the report, there's a page and a half, two pages that deal with the possibility of encountering extraterrestrial intelligence. And it addresses many of the issues that concern us today. Uh, uh, how will people react? Uh, what will it do to the international uh, political system? Uh, how will it affect uh, government leadership? Uh, again, very brief, very concise, uh, but very uh, uh, important. It stated very explicitly that if, for instance, we find evidence of alien artifacts or technology, that this would be a, a tremendously difficult, traumatic experience for not only global religion, but also the world of science. And indeed, uh, I believe the phrase was, it could result in social disintegration. Anthropological files contain many examples of societies sure of their place in the universe, which have disintegrated when they had to associate with previously unfamiliar societies, espousing different ideas and different life ways. The suggestion that was made in this report, incidentally, was that if our space program came up with evidence of alien intelligence or technology, that it might be a good idea not to mention this fact to the public. It might be a very good idea to keep that fact secret. When War of the Worlds and this panic came about, that was the only thing that the Brookings Report could reference, saying, look, NASA, you have to prepare for this. You have to have some kind of procedure or protocol for if the public does get into sheer panic, you have to be prepared. But what is the current policy? Does the U.S. government have a plan? In terms of preparedness, there are not many documents out there to prepare officials for the possibility of a UFO event taking place. But amazingly, there is one such document in the United States. It's called the Firefighter's Guide to Disaster Control, and this is a book. It's used in the Federal Emergency Management Agency's National Academy to train firefighters. The second edition of this book came out in 1993, and that book had a chapter on UFOs, explicitly what would an emergency specialist do in the event of a UFO-related crisis or disaster. It's really pretty amazing stuff to go into a book that was written under the FEMA umbrella it would not be remiss to give some thought to the part that fire departments might play in the event of the unexpected arrival of UFOs in their communities. If there is an event like this, the firefighters and the police officers will be the first people on the scene. And they are instructed in this book to get in touch with the military. I don't think they'll be handling it by themselves for too long, but since they are the first ones on the scene, it, it gives some general guidelines. Among the dangers they listed, I, I believe, were to aircraft. So the uh, knocking out electrical or navigational equipment was one such danger they indicated. Knocking out communications uh, equipment. You may have engine trouble upon approaching the scene, and radio contact could be lost with your dispatcher. Well, there is definitely uh, a concern about a physical object crashing or somehow impacting populations giving specific instructions like do not get too close to the UFO, do not touch the UFO, be prepared for radiation, be prepared for possible psychic effects, um, you know, it might affect your mind in certain ways, you might feel sick. Some combination of air and ground units should be available to treat potential victims of unexplained aerial phenomena. And then it ends the chapter by outlining a scenario of a UFO crashing in a school, it actually 
says there are alien bodies there and you have to decide whether to rescue them or what to do with them. You know, what would you do as a firefighter in such a situation dealing with such an unknown phenomenon? With a good plan, good leadership, and adequate resources, you may save many lives in any disaster, including attack from possible enemies. But many researchers doubt this document is the comprehensive plan that the government has for when UFOs land in our neighborhood. There really aren't that many recommendations on what one would do. Well, the main thing that they say is if you have firearms, don't shoot at the vehicle. All right, well, I think that's probably good, very good advice. But beyond that, there's really not an awful lot that they recommend. It is the one document, I think, in the United States that we know about that uh, indicates a concern that our officials be prepared for such an event taking place. This manual is apparently found in most fire houses throughout the country. Um, I have looked into whether the police department has a similar manual and have been told that they don't. The military has no manuals that we know of like this. I'm sure that they do that are not made public. Is there more than what is being made public? Surprisingly, other governments have contingency plans for ET's arrival. You also need to know that some governments are getting impatient with this. A perfect example is France. When we return, the French develop emergency procedures. After strange lights descend on the neighboring country of Belgium. Belgium. November 29th, 1989. Policemen on patrol outside the city of Eupen see a mysterious triangular object with blinding lights hovering over a field. For the police officers, it is the beginning of a three-hour journey tracking the UFO across the countryside. For Belgium, it is the beginning of a nearly two-year-long wave of UFO sightings. The significant wave of sightings over uh, Belgium in particular in 1989 and 1990 of a triangular aircraft have yet to be identified to this day. On that first night, the police are swamped with telephone calls from 150 witnesses. Soon, sightings of the Yupin Triangle, as it comes to be called, are reported throughout the country. The UFO phenomena there results in an unprecedented level of cooperation between various government agencies and private UFO investigators. Some consider the actions taken in Belgium a model for developing a plan to deal with other UFO incidents. The Belgium Air Force quickly takes the lead in setting up a procedure for tracking this unidentified flying object. Colonel Wilfred de Browner, the Air Force's Chief of Operations, coordinates a special task force to work with local and national police agencies, as well as civilian UFO investigators. On the night of March 30th, 1990, the Triangle is sighted again. Two Belgian F-16 fighters are scrambled from Beauvachain Air Base. Despite flying for over an hour, the pilots are unable to make visual contact with the UFO, but do manage to record radar images of it. The encounter leads some to speculate that the Yupin Triangle is actually an American craft. If so, the most likely culprit would be the F-117A stealth fighter. This secret, triangular-shaped aircraft is designed to have a minimal radar signature. But sophisticated analysis conducted on both ground-based and on-board radar images of the Yupin Triangle calls this theory into doubt. According to the radar, the UFO could, within seconds, accelerate from 170 to 1100 miles an hour and drop from 11,000 feet to near ground level. Maneuvers like those would generate an enormous g-force far in excess of what military testing films show a human can endure, thereby dismissing the possibility of the UFO as man or American-made. The sightings in Belgium, whatever their source, eventually subside. But not before nearly 2,000 people report seeing that flying triangle. After that wave had passed, uh, some members of the European Parliament wanted to organize a 
uh, UFO investigative body, or actually they wanted to contract a uh, French UFO organization to work with them to check into UFO reports that were on a European-wide basis. That organization is known as SEPRA, a French acronym for Service for Assessment of Atmospheric Reentry Phenomena. Housed in France's National Center for Space Research, it is a cooperative European effort for collecting and analyzing UFO information from around the world. In 1999, SEPRA's extensive data provides the basis for a report issued by a French group called Cometa, which translated is the Committee for In-Depth Studies. There have been various studies over the years, but this is really an historic study because of the caliber of the people that wrote it and because of the conclusion that they drew. And this study said a number of interesting things, not the least of which was that the most likely explanation for the phenomena studied is extraterrestrial. In light of this conclusion, Cometa laid the groundwork for determining a contact protocol in their official report titled, UFOs and Defense, What Should We Prepare For? There's a lot of concern in the report that the lack of preparedness could lead to problems it's because if an event happens, people are not informed as to what the phenomena is and how they should respond. The report clearly states, for the moment, they do not appear to be meddling in our affairs, but it is advisable to ask ourselves what they are actually seeking. What should we prepare for? How should we prepare for it? And that's what, in fact, these military officials and government officials were trying to come across with, is that there had to be a preparation for this. If we do nothing, the very principle of defense and air intelligence would be called into question. They recommend that a, a, a widespread training campaign be undertaken to educate people in official positions how to respond, what the phenomena is, what the evidence is, what they should do if they encounter something. According to the report, those who must be utilized in this regard include meteorologists, space and aeronautical engineers, and air traffic controllers. Only the military controller has adequate equipment to detect a flying object that does not follow general air traffic rules, moving at the supposed speeds of UFOs. The report makes special mention of military pilots as our first means of intervention if, by chance, this were to prove necessary. But it goes on to express concern for the pilot of a commercial aircraft. Although he remains a primary partner in the quest for information, he would be totally powerless in the face of an aggressive stance by a UFO. One must be on guard against any instinctive self-defense reaction that could be easily interpreted as a provocation. Part of the concern is not to initiate any actions that could be dangerous. For instance, at a military base, if staff witnessed an object and didn't know anything about what it might be, that there could be a reaction of hostility. For instance, they, they wouldn't know, are they supposed to be defensive towards this object? The Comita report, although that was sent to the President of France, Jacques Chirac, and sent to a number, number of other high-ranking individuals, it's unclear what kind of impact the Comita report has had on policy. The problem is that when you're dealing with figuring out UFO policy, you're trying to put together a big puzzle with half of the pieces taken out. And often, they weren't taken out accidentally, they were taken out intentionally. So we, we don't have all of the information we would like. It's unfortunate, but that's the fact. Coming up, as Cold War tensions rise, the UFO problem threatens to trigger Armageddon. The Cold War. Across the U.S., and the Soviet Union. Missile detection systems stand vigilant, tracking all incoming objects, ready to unleash an awesome counter-strike should the unthinkable ever happen. But what if the inbound object is actually a non-threatening UFO? 
Might fear of the unknown inadvertently trigger Armageddon? In 1971, just such a scenario was envisioned and planned for. In uh, September of 1971, there was a nuclear agreement between the United States and the Soviet Union. There was one interesting part of that agreement which dealt with the need to be aware of unidentified objects for either country that would in, you know, possibly cause an alert status to go off. The historic agreement on measures to reduce the risk of outbreak of nuclear war covers a number of scenarios. Article 3 of the agreement states the parties undertake to notify each other immediately in the event of detection by missile warning systems of unidentified objects. If such occurrences could create a risk of outbreak of nuclear war between the two countries. But the meaning of unidentified object has raised interest in some quarters. Now it is not necessarily the case that an unidentified object would mean an, a UFO in the sense that we understand that. However, I think it's undeniable that an unidentified object would very probably also refer to true UFOs. But of course, you have to remember, all of these documents, whenever we're dealing with UFOs, they're so carefully worded that, uh, you know, nothing explicit really is said. Article 6 of the agreement details the notification procedure for these incidents. For transmission of urgent information, the parties shall make primary use of the direct communications link between the governments of the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. But to use the direct communications link, the information first has to get to the highest levels of the U.S. government. And a protocol for making that happen also exists. Air Force Manual 10-206, most recently updated in June 2001, gives the primary reporting instructions for that branch of the military, which mans the country's missile detection system. Compliance with these reporting instructions is mandatory. Chapter 3 details operational status reports, referred to as OPREP-3. The highest priority in the OPREP-3 structure is given to reports denoted by the flag words Pinnacle nuke flash, indicating events which risk the outbreak of nuclear war. According to these instructions, included in these events is detection of unidentified objects by a missile warning system that appears threatening and could create a risk of nuclear war. These reports, both immediate voice reports and follow-up written ones, go to the Air Force Operations Center in the Pentagon, Strategic Command, NORAD, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Rapid reporting is imperative. Do not delay an initial report for lack of information. Due to the extremely time-sensitive nature of the Pinnacle Nuke Flash Report, transmit these voice reports no later than five minutes after learning of the event. Though this Air Force protocol uses the term unidentified object, as did the U.S.-USSR agreement, many researchers have little doubt of its true intent. I mean, after all, uh, within the U.S., there had, even by 1971, been a long history, very long history of significant, serious, grave airspace violations by UFOs. This had happened many, many times. Uh, we presume that the Soviets did too. They had a lot of UFO sightings of their own. Though what ultimately happens to Pinnacle nuke flash reports is cloaked under layers of secrecy, they do demonstrate international cooperation, which many think is the key to dealing with the UFO question. In 1977, an effort is made to put the United Nations in the center of implementing the UFO protocol. Grenada. Following a spate of UFO sightings over the tiny island nation, its Prime Minister, Eric Gehry, proposes an initiative to incorporate the UFO problem into the UN's official agenda, and even calls for 1978 to be the United Nations International Year of Unidentified Flying Objects. 
But the Grenada Initiative fails, garnering no preparation plans and no discussion of UFO contacts whatsoever. There are people that would prefer not to have any evidence of extraterrestrial life whatsoever, that it really violates their views of Earth, of uh, how the universe works, of our sense of being distinctive and, and privileged by being what we are here on this planet. Still, the United Nations does figure into some protocol regarding alien intelligence. Those dealing with an organization of astronomers called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. What the rules call for is first of all verification by different observatories, then uh, reporting to various scientific agencies in the UN. Because the idea is that this discovery will be made you know, for all humankind. Coming up, a law authorizing the government to lock up people who have been extraterrestrially exposed. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, began in 1971 as a NASA program. It primarily uses radio telescopes located around the globe, pointed towards small sections of space, to listen for anomalous signals sent by natural or extraterrestrial sources. SETI's kind of a fun program. Astronomers have told me that, that the odds aren't real high that we'll find anything out there. But I think it's a good idea. If, if we listen, we might hear something. If we don't listen, we definitely won't hear anything. Though the government stopped funding SETI in 1993, it continues as a private program. And should the search for extraterrestrial intelligence be successful and contact made, there is a plan for what to do. Call the declarations of principles concerning activities following the detection of extraterrestrial intelligence. The procedure calls for verifying plausible explanations, not making any public statement until evidence is credible, contacting the United Nations, and not sending any response to an extraterrestrial signal until appropriate international consultations have taken place. So even if it's a small possibility, I think it's worth it just in case um, we hear something unusual. That would be an exciting day. Many researchers continue to believe the government has more extensive plans for when UFOs land here on our planet. But time and time again, official government secrecy surrounding the issue has stymied their efforts at discovering what these plans may be. The researchers in the field can only go so far because the government doesn't want it to go any further. And in the absence of honest, straightforward, and open engagement, you grab anything you can and try to find a connection. Some researchers believed that a now repealed federal law called extraterrestrial exposure was that elusive connection. The law was passed by the U.S. Congress in July 1969, just days before the Apollo 11 astronauts landed on the moon. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. It authorized NASA to quarantine under armed guard any object, person, or other form of life which has been extraterrestrially exposed. But what does extraterrestrially exposed actually mean? That document, I think, has been greatly misunderstood and misquoted and taken to mean that uh, it deals with alien life forms, for instance. Well, I first came to uh, NASA in 1964 during the Gemini program and then on into the Apollo program that took us to the moon and back. Well, I remember very clearly the concern was that if there are microbes on the moon, we didn't want to bring them back here and then contaminate our planet. While the extraterrestrial exposure law may not have been the smoking gun some researchers had hoped for, many believe that we can learn something about the government's plans for UFOs by looking at other programs in the intelligence community. I do believe that it's most likely that the U.S. government would be the dominant player in determining a UFO policy at the classified level. I think a good model for this might be the program known as Echelon, 
which doesn't officially exist, but everyone knows exists. This is a uh, electronic intercept program led by America's National Security Agency in conjunction with the NSA equivalents of Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Echelon has been called the most powerful intelligence gathering organization in the world. It employs an array of surveillance systems around the globe to intercept an estimated three billion communications every day, from telephone calls to emails. Though Australia has admitted its part in Echelon, the NSA still will not answer questions about it, even questions from Congress. Just as Echelon is a global program that is of very, very high levels of secrecy and importance and classification, so too I think it's likely that the UFO phenomenon has a similar kind of international organization that is in all likelihood dominated by uh, American players. Meanwhile, the UFO question will not go away. For every unexplained flash of light in the sky, for every unidentified flying object, a new chapter is written. And for those whose jobs put them on the front lines, it's more than a passing curiosity. All right, so we just a couple real bright flashes of light. Anything that is sufficient to disturb or upset a pilot poses some risk to the aircraft, the passengers, and the cargo. And uh, someone needs to look into it. The government's documents certainly show that the government takes the subject seriously, that they're interested in it, and that they realize that it's real, regardless of what they say publicly. Given that, one would have to assume that they must have some concern about being prepared. There is far more information that the government holds on this subject than you can imagine, and I'm sure that it includes a whole regimen of protocols to deal with an ET-driven event. They're not going to publish that because, you see, that would be a little hard to explain in the context of their normal pronouncement that, what ET? I don't know. It's a UFO, so it's that Roswell crap again.